Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so excited that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. Our goal here is to be a church that glorifies God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all people. And our prayer is that if you are not connected to a Bible-believing church, that you would come and be with us here at First. But if you are, we don't want this to be any kind of substitute. We want you to be actively involved in the ministry of your church. But we are so happy that you are with us and we pray that God will use his word to change your life for the glory of God. Take your copy of God's word, turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, the words will be on the screen behind me and let's stand as we read God's word, Psalm 127. It is a Psalm of Ascent written by Solomon. The Holy Spirit says today, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when his enemy, when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. You may be seated. The message this morning is the theology of sleep. Maybe that's not what you expected on the 4th of July weekend. But here's the question for you. How many of you have trouble sleeping? Some of you do. Sleep deprivation, according to the CDC, which we know knows a lot of things, right? <laughs> Sleep deprivation, according to the CDC, is an epidemic among many Americans. Over 40 million Americans sleep less than six hours each night. Most studies on sleep have found that the majority of Americans over the age of 10 do not get enough sleep at night. Around 25% of Americans suffer with some form of insomnia, some of it being acute. 50 to 70 million Americans have some sort of sleep disorder. Uh, studies show that the older you get, the less sleep that you need, but yet the harder it is for you to sleep. And so you get your first nap during The Price is Right and your second nap during Wheel of Fortune. Neuroscientists and medical doctors say that sleep is probably, if not the best thing you can do for your health. It can boost your immune system, prevent weight gain, strengthen your heart, create a better mood, improve memory, increase exercise performance, and help you in your interpersonal relationships. Most elite athletes uh, sleep between nine and 11 hours a night. So think of modern elite athletes, Olympians, professional uh, players. They all get multiple hours of sleep a night. Uh, Tom Brady, if you don't know if you've ever heard of him, uh, Tom Brady, who's come out of retirement to play again, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I'm just kidding. He goes to bed during the season at 8.30 p.m. He goes to bed before his kids, and he wakes up at 5.30 a.m. And so if you want to be an elite athlete, uh, then you need to sleep more. And so some of you middle school teenagers, high school teenagers, you, when you're sleeping, just say, parents, I'm training to be an elite athlete. And so there you are, right? So if you, you may be wondering, why do they eat so much and sleep so much? Because they're training. They're training. Now, this message this morning is about how to get a good night's sleep, but I want you to understand that I am not a medical doctor, and I know that some of you in this room or those of you watching online have a diagnosable sleeping disorder, and so I don't want you to leave here thinking that this message is telling you that you can't sleep because you have some spiritual problems, but this message is very practical, and as we are going through this series, Shabbat Shalom, as we think about the practicalities of rest, one of the things that we do in our life every day is sleep. And so what this message is geared about, it's meant to help us, you and I, to trust God in the midst of the ordinary challenges and opportunities of life so that we can get a good night's sleep. And what we're going to learn is that there is a spiritual component 
to sleep. And so Psalm 127, it's a song of ascent. It's uh, from 120 to 134. Uh, that was the playlist, the Spotify playlist that the Israelites listened to as they made their way to pilgrimage in Jerusalem for the annual feast. And so they listened to these songs that focused their hearts and their minds on the Lord to prepare them for the worship of God in the city of God. And so Psalm 127 was written by King Solomon. It's number eight on the, 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 the charts here and seven come before it and seven come after it. And what we're going to see as we unpack this is that the song teaches us that human effort is useless apart from God. So human effort is useless apart from God, whether it's building a building, protecting a city or raising children. And so God gives us sleep as a gift to point us to this reality that is useless without God. And so this song is a lullaby that helps God's people to get a good night's sleep. And so the hope of this message is that when you leave here, you will learn this, that God will give us sleep. He will give us the sleep that we need when we trust in his sovereign work over our lives and his special love for us. So let's unpack that. He gives sleep to those who trust in his sovereign work over us and his special love for us. So let's look at that, the sovereign work of God over us. In verse one, the Holy Spirit says through Solomon, unless the Lord builds the house, and then he says, unless the Lord watches the city. Uh, Solomon, by all accounts, was a very hard worker. Uh, he was an overachiever. He had 700 wives. <laughs> That's overachieving. He built the temple, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He was responsible as king for the safety and security of his entire kingdom. And yet Solomon, being the wisest man, uh, knew ultimately that it was the Lord that builds the house and it's the Lord that watches over the city. God is the one who provides and God is the one who protects. And so what Solomon is presenting to us is a very God-saturated view of life. As you look at his Proverbs in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Heart, lean not into your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him. And so here God through Solomon is saying that you need to acknowledge that in all that you do, God is at work. Now, he's not saying that we don't build and he's not saying that we don't watch. We do build, we do watch. He is not saying that we're just to sit around and do nothing, like to just take up the astronaut program and just take up space. He is saying that we are to work. He's not saying Build or don't build or watchmen don't watch. We must continue to work and we must continue to watch, but yet not trust in and rely completely on ourselves. We are to trust and rely on God who is working and God who is watching. So God is the one who, uh, who is at work to accomplish all of his good purposes and we must rely on him and not ourselves for the final outcome of all things. And so he is saying here that it is not us who ultimately and decisively build or protect, it is God. And so he uses the word twice, or at least three times in two verses, the word vain. It's not the word that he uses in Ecclesiastes, havel, but it is a word that means useless. And so he says that it is useless to watch without God. It is useless to build without God. It is empty. It is vain. You cannot produce anything or protect anything without the Lord. And so in verse two, he says, it is useless or it is vain that you rise up early and go to bed late. Now, I, this is not exactly what this text is saying, but I do believe that some of you need to hear that you need to go to bed earlier than you do. And so some of you in this room need to stop staying up all night playing video games, stop scrolling mindlessly on social media and stop binge watching TV and go to bed. Amen? Amen. I think so. I know it's convicting now in the room. But that's not what this text is saying, but it's something you needed to hear. What this text is saying is that no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you watch, no matter how many hours a day you give yourself to something, if God's not in it, then it doesn't matter if you're in it. It's vain to get up early. It's vain to stay up late. It's vain, it's useless thinking that it's up to you to make something happen. 
Now our world has changed in two years. There's two certain years in the past 200 years of human history that really has changed. One would be 2007 with the invention of the iPhone. That's really when the world changed. Think about that. Before 2007, kids, you didn't have a smartphone, you had a dumb phone. But there's another date before that that happened that really changed everything in human history, and that happened in 1879, and there was an invention that was given a patent issued to Thomas Alva Edison. This patent was issued for his invention in which the patent says of carbon filament made of cotton and linen thread, wood splints, and papers coiled in various ways. It was the invention and the patent given to the electric light bulb. Think about that. Before 1879, there was no electric light bulb. And so this invention invited humanity into a world that never sleeps. Edison himself, the inventor, believed that sleep was a waste of time and claimed that he never slept more than four hours a day. He was known to work over 100 hours a week. He would hold job interviews for his employees at 4 a.m. He would insist that anyone who works for him would adhere to the same sleepless schedule that he did. And he even said in 1914, there's really no reason why men should go to bed at all. But if you follow Edison's life, he was a very miserable, unkind, dissatisfied, paranoid, cruel man. Why? Because you got to sleep. Amen. You got to sleep. Jen Wilkins says, our inability or unwillingness to cease from working is a confession of unbelief, an admission that we view ourselves as creator and sustainer of our own universe. This wrong thinking renders us as slaves to our own ambition. He says, it is vain to get up early and vain to stay up late, thinking that the world depends upon you. And when you do that, you are eating the bread of anxious toil. It is foolish to live a life in which you think the world and everything in it depends upon you, living under the burden of the anxiety that comes with carrying the world on your shoulders. You are not Atlas. You are not the mythological Greek God who is banished to carry the world on his shoulders. That statue that maybe you see in various places is a parable of someone who is attempting to achieve the impossible, carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. And that is what happens to the person who watches and works as if they are God. Now you say, well, preacher, are you saying that we should just live passive lives? No, I've said that we shouldn't live passive lives. We are to work. We are to watch. We are to get up in the morning and we are to go to bed. And I know that Solomon himself didn't find virtue in being lazy. Solomon all throughout his Proverbs talks about the sluggard, the sluggard who would rather starve than strive, who would rather receive a handout than put his hand to work. But what Solomon is getting at is not being lazy. Solomon is saying that you were born with limitations, that God made you to be a physical being that was limited by design. You're not omniscient. You are not omnipotent. You are not omnipresent. You cannot do it all, be it all, see it all, know it all, and control it all. You have limitations that prove that you are not God. And one of those limitations is sleep. And that's why he says in verse two, it's vain to get up early. It's vain to get up, stay up late. He gives his beloved sleep. God gives us sleep as a gift, even though God never sleeps. This is not a communicable attribute of God. God, the Bible says in Psalm 121, verse four, neither slumbers nor sleeps. We go to sleep because we were created to sleep. God made sleep to be a continual reminder that we are not God and therefore we should not be anxious and live as if it all depends upon us, but we should sleep at night knowing that it all depends upon him. Sleep dissipates our desire to take ourselves too seriously. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. This sickness is the chronic tendency to think that we are in control and that our work is indispensable. But yet we can go to sleep because God has it under control. He doesn't need to sleep, but we desperately do. And so what we learn within this series of Shabbat Shalom, that God created a rhythm of work and rest, and that if we do not rest, if we do not sleep very long, our bodies and our souls will be completely damaged. 
See, God created us to spend a third of our lives doing nothing except depending upon him. And so when you go to sleep every night, here's what you're saying. You're saying, God, I trust you. You'll be okay without me. The world won't fall apart. That's what sleep is. And listen, you can sleep tonight knowing that God's got it all under control, that God is God. You can sleep at night knowing that. You can rest knowing that. And so as you read verses one through, through two, you kind of see where he's saying is that life is useless or things are, it is useless to live life without reference to God. And if God is not in it, it doesn't matter if I'm in it. But when you read verses three through five, you're like, well, how does this connect? And what verses three through five are, are an illustration. Solomon, just as he illustrated about building and watching, he's now going to illustrate that without God's intervention and help, our labor in raising children is vain. He says in verse three, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Yes, children do come out of a union between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And on the outside, it may look like that it was their production, that they made a baby. But yet Solomon wants us to understand that they didn't make a baby. God made the baby. The baby came from God. He says the fruit of the womb, not the fruit of the loom, is a reward. It is a blessing. Children are a blessing. They come from God. They come only from God. They don't come from the stork, from God. He wants to reiterate in our minds that children are not an inconvenience. Children are not a burden. Children are a gift. They are a blessing. They are a gift that keeps on giving. But with that being said, our kids are also what often keep us up at night. How many sleepless nights have many of you had over your children? So what this psalm is doing in this connection is showing us that your children and the raising of your children, like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior, what this psalm is calling upon moms and dads to do is to trust God and sleep well at night. Why? Because just as God is the one who ultimately and decisively builds the house, and protects the city, he is also the one who builds the family, protects the family, and raises the kids. Yes, we are to build. Yes, we are to protect. Yes, we are to raise. But it is God who ultimately works in and through us to do his good will. Tim Keller, uh, in his book, devotional called The Songs of Jesus, talks in about 127 in which he writes the following. He says, helicopter parenting and over-involvement in our children's lives cannot ensure their health and happiness. He says, unless the Lord enters their lives, all our watching is in vain. Giving our children to God is the only way we get to keep them. Solomon says, listen, the Lord gives you the child. The fruit of the womb is your reward. Blessed is the man who has children. Blessed is the man who is, whose quiver is filled with them. Blessed is the one who will have his children speak against his enemies. Blessed is the one who has children in their life. And so this is a blessing that does not come from you, but it comes ultimately from God. And so just as God blesses the house and builds the house and washes the city and protects the city and gives his children and raises those children so we can trust God and we can go to sleep because God is sovereign over all. Now, don't get from this text that Solomon says that because God is sovereign and working, it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. We live in a fallen, broken world. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer. It doesn't mean that our house may not catch on fire. It doesn't mean that our car won't get broken into. It doesn't mean that our children will not get hurt. Those things can happen. But what it does mean is that even if they do happen, it doesn't mean that God isn't in control and that he doesn't care. He's not saying that we have to sleep with one eye open at night. We can trust God. Why? Why can we trust God and how can we trust God? Yes, many of you in this room say, Pastor, I believe that God is absolutely sovereign. I believe that he's in control of everything, but I'm worried he won't get it right. Isn't that true? See, Tim Keller said once that worry is saying, God, if I were in control of the universe, things would be different. 
That's the bread of anxious toil. When we live life as if we say we trust God, but then we allow the anxiety of our hearts to counteract that. So how can we trust that yes, God is absolutely sovereign, that God is God as we looked at last week. How can we trust that in his sovereignty that all things will work together for good? How is it that even though bad things may happen into our lives, that we can trust that his purposes and good purposes will stand? How do we know that even though I may not be in control of things, that he is is in control and I can sleep at night. How can I know that? Because it's not just trusting in his sovereign work over us, but it is trusting and resting in his special love for us. And you see that in verse number two. Here's what he says in verse two. For he gives his, say this word with me. He gives his beloved sleep. He gives his beloved sleep. See, you and I can sleep at night because we are God's beloved. God is not only a builder and he's not only a watcher, but he is the lover of our souls. God's love for you is greater than your greatest fears. His perfect love for you enables you to cast fear out of your life so that you can get a good night's sleep. You know, insomnia often goes together with anxiety and depression. They feed off of each other. They're like a dog chasing its tail. You can't sleep because you're worried, but then you're worried that you can't sleep. And so you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep and you start having all these things come into your mind and you think about everything that went wrong the day before and everything you're worried about the next day and you think about all the stuff that you've got to fix and all the, all the issues of, of the week that are ahead. And then once you've figured out all those things, then you have these bad thoughts that come into your mind and you start listening to yourself and you allow the thoughts that, that say things like this, tomorrow's gonna be, tomorrow's just gonna be worse than I can even imagine. I'm never gonna be happy again. I can't live like this. It's never gonna get better. There's no hope. I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough. God is against me. God wants me to be miserable. And you can't go to sleep. Martin Lloyd-Jones gave a prescription for those who listen to the voices in their head. And here's what he says. He says, stop listening to yourself and preach the gospel to yourself. In other words, when those voices come ringing into your mind as you're trying to sleep at night, the best thing you can do is stop listening and remind yourself the truth that you are God's beloved. He gives his beloved sleep. See, the Psalms are filled with people preaching the gospel to themselves. The Psalms are filled with those who are going through many dangers, toils, and snares. The, God, the Psalms are filled with those who had enemies that were after them, children that wanted to kill them, people that wanted to destroy them, and sins that they've committed, and fears that they had. And all throughout the Psalms, the psalmists cry out, rejoice! Sing, take refuge. Why are you cast down? Hope in God. And all throughout the Psalms, the psalmists complain to the Lord, but they do not complain about the Lord. They tell the Lord their problems and then they preach the gospel to themselves. And that's what you and I need to remind ourselves that we are his beloved a few weeks ago, I was in California for some meetings. It's the other side of the moon. Came and there's three hour time difference. It's the left coast. <laughs> three hour time difference, worlds apart. Arrive around 10 or 11 o'clock our time and go through LA traffic, arrive at the hotel about 
one o'clock our time, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, what is that o'clock? Their time, go to bed. And it's two o'clock my time. It's 11 o'clock their time. And I try to go to sleep. And I'm a persnickety sleeper. Anyone else persnickety? I like the bed to be just right, the pillow to be just right. I like white noise. Anyone else in the room like white noise? I do. I'm unashamed. I unashamedly carry a box fan to hotels with me. <laughs> I just want you to know that. So if you ever see me, <laughs> and so I was laying in bed, comfortable bed, everything was okay, but I couldn't sleep. 11 o'clock their time turned into 12 o'clock their time, which is three o'clock my time. Then, uh, then, then one o'clock their time was four o'clock my time and two o'clock their time was five o'clock my time. And I just finally had enough. And that verse, the verse that we read, came into my mind. He gives his beloved sleep. And in that moment, I said to God, God, I am your beloved child. You love me more than I can fathom. And tonight I need sleep. So take these thoughts out of my mind. And in your love, knock me out. <laughs> in Jesus' name. And the next thing I knew, it was 7 a.m. Now, that's not a name and claim it thought there. That's not a blab it and grab it. I know that some of you suffer with severe insomnia because of physical issues and biochemical issues. But for others, the heart of the issue and the reason you can't sleep at night is a sinful disposition of anxiety and depression that comes from a lack of understanding of who you are in Jesus Christ. Christ. You are his beloved. You are his. Therefore, you don't need to eat the bread of anxious toil. Anxiety is living out the future before it gets here. Let me give you two verses. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now a New Testament one. Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, Jesus says, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, don't borrow tomorrow's trouble tonight. Tomorrow may have trouble, but just as tomorrow may have trouble, we can be assured that tomorrow will have mercy, that there is a new batch of mercy that God provides you every single morning. So don't live out of tomorrow's trouble when you haven't received tomorrow's mercy. Let tomorrow take care of tomorrow and you trust, in to God, you trust in God tonight. In other words, don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Trust Jesus to pay them both. He gives his beloved sleep. His beloved. See, sleep in the Bible has always implied a deep trust in God. Sleep itself is an act of trust. The ancients struggled sleeping. If you read historical documents, there were many who struggled with sleeping. So just as you struggle with sleeping, you're not alone. They've been struggling for sleeping for thousands of years. To sleep in antiquity meant that you felt safe at night. It implied that you felt safe enough that someone else was watching over you because when you slept in antiquity, you were vulnerable to the attacks of wild animals and robbers. But the truth is, is that if you and I don't feel safe, we won't be able to sleep. You know, a few years ago, and every now and again, your kids maybe will wake you up in the middle of the night. Any of your kids ever wake you up in the middle of the night? You're dead to the world, asleep, drool hanging from your mouth. 
They come up, tap you on the, the leg, scare you half to death. <laughs> they say, Daddy, Mommy, we can't sleep. And because they can't sleep, they wanna make sure you can't sleep either. And the reason that they can't sleep and the reason you can't sleep is the reason that they can't sleep is because they're afraid of something. And so what do you do if you're a dad? Your kid wakes you up and they can't sleep. Well, you wake your wife up. (laughs) Or... You take them to their bed or you help them feel safe because when your kids feel safe, they can go to sleep. What are they afraid of? The boogeyman, something hit their head. When they feel safe, they can sleep. When you feel safe, you can sleep. How many of you can sleep when someone else is driving? (laughs) It's hard for some of us in this room to sleep when someone else is driving because we don't trust that they'll drive very well. And so we want them to, to, uh, to be good. And so we stay awake to make sure that they drive the way we think they should drive, right? It's control issues. God wants us to sleep knowing he's in control. And God wants us to sleep knowing that he loves us. And when you know that God is in control and you know that God loves you, you can sleep. See, sleep and safety are connected in the Bible. There are two Psalms of David that Solomon, who is David's dad, wrote when he was on the run from Absalom and King Saul. Psalm 3, verse 5, uh, so, uh, David writes, he says, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. Psalm 4, verse 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. David had his son Absalom after him. David had Saul after him. David had so many things against him, and yet he went to sleep and woke up again, and he could sleep because he trusted God with his life. How can you and I do that? How could David do that? How could David, who was on the run, trust God, even though the circumstances of his life didn't really look very good? And how could Solomon write a song and sing a song about sleep? How could these guys do that? How could they trust God? The only way they could trust God and the only way that they knew they could trust God because they knew God loved them. God loved them. See, when you know someone loves you and you know that they have your best interest at heart, you sleep better. So Solomon says he gives his beloved sleep. It's a very interesting word that he uses here, the word beloved. It's the Hebrew word yadid. It, 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 it kind of can be transliterated and has been transliterated into a name. And if you look at the phrase, his beloved, that could be transliterated into the English, a name or a word that you've heard before. It's the name Jedediah. You ever heard of Jedediah? The word Jedediah is his beloved. And guess what that name was to Solomon? It was his nickname. Did you know that? Jedediah was Solomon's nickname. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, the Bible says, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. There's a story there. He went into her, lay with her. She bore a son. She called his name Solomon. Verse 25. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedediah because of the Lord. The Lord's beloved, beloved of the Lord, his beloved. This name was given to Solomon before Solomon had done anything good or did anything bad. God in his 
grace set his affection and love on Solomon, calling him his beloved. Now, if you know anything about Solomon or maybe you know nothing about Solomon, Solomon had some problems. Solomon married 700 women and had 300 other women in his life. I'll leave it there. I got one wife and she's the best woman in the whole wide world. Solomon had a lot. He made a lot of mistakes. He had a lot of flaws. He he was a sinner. And if you read the scriptures, he did some really, really bad things. And yet God, in his grace, before he'd ever done anything good or bad, put his affection on Solomon and called him his beloved Solomon was wicked. And even though Solomon did not earn it nor deserve it, God loved him and gave him sleep. So he could say, he gives Jedediah sleep. And just as God loved Solomon, and gave him sleep. So God loves his people and gives them the gift of sleep. You say, how is that possible? How can I know that God loves me? Pastor, you don't know all the bad that I've done. You don't know all the thoughts that I've had. How can I know that despite all the evil that I've done, that God loves me enough to give me sleep? How can I trust in him? I'm glad you asked. Such a good group. Verse three, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a blessing, a fulfillment of a promise by the Lord. See, Solomon had children and these children were a fulfillment of a promise. They were a fulfillment of a promise given to Abraham. And the the Bible says that Abraham would bless the nations. And so from Abraham and from Solomon would come a son who would bless the nations. From the fruit of the womb, God would send his only son, Jesus Christ, as an arrow from God sent to destroy the work of his father's enemies. Jesus, as the beloved son, stood at the gates of hell, fought our enemies, won the victory, and now there is no shame or condemnation for those who trust in him. Jesus did the hard work for us so we can sleep at night. Jesus purchased the rights to this song. And the reason that Solomon or you or ever could be beloved in the eyes of God is because of what Jesus, God's beloved, did for us. We are not beloved because of what we do for God. We are beloved because of what the beloved did for us. And that is why when Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, preparing himself to go to the cross after he had spoken to Moses and Elijah, there was a voice of the father that said to the world, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Stop listening to the voices in your head. Stop listening to the voices of our culture. Stop listening to the voice of Satan and listen to the voice of Jesus. He is strength for today. He is hope for tomorrow and he will help you sleep tonight. Rest in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you so much that we can claim this promise that you give your beloved sleep. For because of Jesus, we are your beloved. And so God, today, if there's any in this room or watching online that does not have a relationship with you, God, today, 
Would today be the day of salvation? Would today be the day that they would rest their sins and their guilt and their shame in Jesus and not in themselves? And Father, tonight I ask you out of your pure love that you give everyone in this room and everyone watching online a good night's sleep. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's Word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church. Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.